Ladies and gentlemen, the president of Chile. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll allow our friends from the media a few moments of time to get their photographs in. And in a few moments' time, we'll be handing over for our session three, which will be a televised roundtable summit. And we are honored to have with us our friends from CNBC, and we'll hand over shortly to Martin Sung, who's an anchor with CNBC. They can hear you. <laughs> they all shout. <laughs> we can hear you, Martin. Continue taking pictures while we sort out my microphone. Can we have some help here? Yeah. Thank you. Can we turn them on? Okay, we're not off to a good start oh, here. There you go. Can we? Uh... Now it's working. I think it's working. It's working now. It's no? working. working. Yes. Yes. It's working. Okay. Excellent. Good. Okay. Just warming up. All right. So, folks. Uh, good morning. Selamat pagi. On behalf of APEC and also CNBC, a pleasure to be here with you. I'm very excited. We've got a great panel uh, organized for you. Uh, this uh, session, we're going to spend about an hour with you folks, an hour plus. And what this is going to be is two things in one. We're going to be doing a live event with all of you. And in addition, this is going to be a television event as well. And what I mean by that is, uh, in the past, these APEC panels have been captured on cameras, but they've only had very, very limited distribution as far as I understand. Uh, this time around, though, uh, this is going to be seen on CNBC, so distribution throughout Asia, uh, a lot of the U.S., some of Europe as well. So this is, I think, very quite historic uh, for us as well as for uh, APEC. So I'm very proud to be to be part of that. Uh, you are going to be helping us make television history as well. We want to involve you as much as we can. We've, uh, as always, dedicated a little bit of time towards the end to get you all in. I'm pretty sure there are microphones around or they'll be coming to you. So towards the end, we'll take questions, uh, comments also from the floor. Please, uh, please feel free, don't be shy. Uh, I only ask a couple of things. One, tell us who you are, where you're from, and who you represent, and also who your question or comment is directed towards. That would be very useful uh, for us. Okay, so basically today, we're here talking about uh, growth. Is there growth? Yes. Is there enough of it? No. Where do we find that extra growth? How do we find that extra growth? Who does it come from? From the government, from the private sector, through trade agreements, or what? So this is very big and broad. We can roam far and wide, and I'd be very interested. We were warming up uh, uh, earlier on in the, in the holding room, and uh, I already heard a lot of very interesting ideas from, uh, from uh, Chris and all, from all our panelists, uh, in fact. So if we're ready, uh, Let's get this thing underway. Small bit of housekeeping, communications devices, cell phones, iPhones, Blackberries, et cetera. If you could, we would appreciate if you could turn them off just for the duration of this, uh, this panel. If you really have to keep them on, uh, then silent would be ideal, just so it doesn't interrupt uh, what we're doing. And just to let you know, I mean, if, if they're left on, sometimes they can interfere with the equipment, and then that's not such a good thing. OK? All right, fantastic. Uh, we are just about all set. So, 
Do we have some videos to play? Okay, we're still counting down. We've got about a minute uh, to go. Let me quickly... Ah, there's our sound. It's been five years since the global financial crisis shook the foundations of the world's economy. Today, global growth is starting to regain momentum, and fundamentals are looking soft, thanks in large part to the world's twin engines of growth, China and the U.S. But concerns about America's tight labor market and China's shadow banking system continue to dog those nations. And with emerging market economies now starting to wobble, our traditional drivers of growth no longer applicable. Over the next hour, we'll talk about where our future growth will come from and talk the TBS for growth. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian Pinier, President of Cuba. Jackie Tosh, Finance Minister of Indonesia. Chris Feinberg, CEO of Senate. Jim Lewis, Senior Vice President. Hello, uh, folks. Uh, welcome uh, to this special debate here at the Apex Summit on uh, Growth. You've uh, been introduced to our panelists. Let's get this right underway, and let me start out of uh, because of protocol and also out of respect with uh, Mr. President Piñera there. When you think about growth, you have a unique perspective, I think, because in less than two months, you will more likely than not be, be leaving office, if I'm not uh, correct. So it might be easier for you to, to say a lot of things now than it was, let's say, at the beginning of, of your term. Um, it's a, an amazing story, your country, Chile, but it is also a bit of a one-trick pony, is it not? Copper and China. You need to diversify, obviously. You need to keep more value added at home. You need to deal with immediate problems of inflation. I know. Growth going forward, though, if you had advice for whoever is taking over from you, what would you be telling them about development and growth in Chile? Thank you very much, Martin. First of all, don't shorten my period. I still have six months to go. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer your question. After the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, the world has enjoyed two decades which can be considered a golden period in terms of growth. Growth was everywhere, in the US, in Europe, in the Asian giants like China and India, which were growing at the pace of more than 10%, and also in the emerging economies. But something happened in 2008, which uh, changed things to the worst. Since then, the economy has been going through very difficult times, and as you are fully aware, Europe is growing very little, almost nothing. The U.S. recovery is weakened, weaker and uh, less stable than predicted. The Asian giants are not growing at 10% or more. And the emerging world, of course, is receiving the effects. What I think, what I think has to be done in order to recover our capacity to grow at 5 or more percent which was the average growth rate during those two golden decades. I think that very many things and very different things had to be addressed. First of all, in the case of Europe, of course, they will have to face their fiscal deficit and, then, and, and their banking problems because they were consuming more than that they were producing, and that's something that sooner or later you will have to face. In the case of the U.S., I think that they will have to face, and in a better way, than they are doing it now with shutting down the government, their fiscal and current account deficit. In the case of the 
Asian giant, of course, they will have to face their trade surplus and their banking sector. And in the case of countries like Chile and many yeah. underdeveloped or developing countries, by the way, Chile has a main target mission to become a developed country without poverty before the end of this decade. Mm -hmm. Since we are growing at an average of 6% per year, if we keep growing at that pace, we will be able to achieve that. What has to be done? I think that we will need to build four new pillars, which are not only necessary for Chile, but for many other Latin Americans and developing economies. First, we need to, to increase dramatically the quality of our human capital. And for that, we need to undertake a huge educational reform. Otherwise, we won't be able to be part of the science and knowledge society. Second, we need to foster innovation and entrepreneurship. Third, we need to double or triple our investment in science and technology. And fourth, we need to address the poverty problem and to create a society with more equality of opportunity. Mm. Those new four pillars are the basic target of, of the government that I preside. And I think that if we are able and we are successful in building or strengthening those pillars, Chile will be able to become a the first, hopefully not the only, Latin American country able to join the club of the mm. countries that have been able to uh, compatibilize right. growth, progress, democracy, okay. and peace. Okay, this is very interesting, Mr. President. Thank you very much, because right now Chile is already the most affluent Latin American country, and per capita income growth has literally, over the last 10 years, exploded. So this is very interesting. Uh, Pakati, let me uh, come to you on this. Interesting. I, I at first talked about uh, Chile, one trick pony, copper and China, right? When I think of Indonesia, obviously very commodities based uh, as well, but I've heard from your officials, as, uh, from you as well just a couple of minutes ago, your dream, looking ahead, of being a knowledge economy. When I heard these comments, and I have to let you know, this was a, uh, another cabinet level official several years ago, talk about this, I really had to scratch my head because I hadn't heard such ambitious goals since the days of Pat Habibi, if, if you folks remember him, right? This is, we're talking about a quantum leap, are we not? Well, first of all, I think we have to look at about the global context as well. Um, in the past four years, after the global financial crisis, many emerging economies benefited by this quantitative easing and also the high boom of this commodity and energy prices. But looking at the recent development that U.S., for example, producing a shell gas, which somehow will change the equilibrium of the energy balance or of the world. And this is, it somehow, kill, is it going to kill the commodity cycle? Well, if you look at in the past 10 years, for example, there is a positive correlation between energy prices and commodity prices. So the changing of the global structure somehow will also affect Indonesia. A country like Indonesia, we cannot continue only rely on these raw materials and the cheap labor. And in order to anticipate this, and I can see I'm not talking about the five years development, it's probably about 10 to 15 years, something that we really need to prepare. I share uh, President Pinera's view. Mm. is about the role of the innovations, about the human capital. That is why from the beginning now, as a Minister of Finance, I start to provide an incentive the tax credit, for example, if the investor would like to invest on industry or sector, we just do the R&D in Indonesia. We provide an incentive for doing a training in Indonesia. This is a preparation, but when I'm talking about this uh, role of innovation and technology, knowledge-based economy, I'm not talking that we immediately jump into the, for example, the really high tech. You can start something with a very, uh, you know, uh, something really uh, on the ground. For example, like on the garment business, it's very hard to compete for, uh, f uh, for Indonesia to compete with Bangladesh, with the cheap garment. But we can move into the next stage of development by introducing design, fashion, mm. and we find a niche market. Mm. This is the role of the human capital become very important and crucial. And okay. this is the way I look at the future of Indonesia. Of course, mm -hmm. when we are talking about this um, you know, moving to the next stage of development. We cannot do, you know, the, the, the great leap, the quantum leap, because this needs to be supported 
by the good macroeconomic policy, mm. by the visible, you know, um, about comparative advantage as well. And one thing I would like to share with you as well, Martin, in the future, the comparative advantage of the country it will be no longer a physical asset but would be intangible, including the government policy. Mm. So if we are moving into that direction, it means that the government need to provide a conducive investment climate, streamlining regulations, good macroeconomic stability. I do understand that nowadays some emerging markets, including Indonesia, are facing a turbulence due to the financial market. Yeah. But the way I look at it, in the past four years, we were living in the situation which is unnormal because the emerging market enjoy the quantitative easing, the unconventional monetary policy. Mm. Now we have to look at the situation, the world without QE. It means that we are back into normal situation. And if you recall the world without QE at the time, the yield of the UST bills was around three to three and a half percent. Now the situation is back. There will be a probably raising of the long-term interest rate in the US. Mm. The emerging market need to adjust. But mm. if you're talking beyond the short-term turbulence, then now we'll see that the future among the Asian Pacific member economies that will be there, mm. including resources, including uh, consuming class, the growing middle class, and the most important one is moving to the next stage of development into the knowledge economy. Interesting. Okay, Pak, we'll come back to you in just a little bit, but Oleg, let me bring you in on this. You're obviously a, a resources guy, uh, commodities, Rusal, uh, aluminum, or, or uh, uh, alumina. Uh, and we were talking a couple of minutes ago in the holding room, and you were saying that, look, the story for commodities, for resources, is far from dead. In fact, smart, wise investment policy can translate into the goals that both Bakatib as well as Mr. President were talking about. Human capital, correct? Yeah, but you, you cannot develop human capital with, without, uh, you know, prep, you know proper problem you know, to solve. You need to build infrastructure. You can't you know, attract money enough you know, to build infrastructure without project. And processing of raw materials is important uh, you know, driver you know, to you know, develop infrastructure. And we're very interested in Indonesia at the moment, and especially the way they try to guide and create roadmap for development uh, of resource sector. Mm -hmm. Yes, many people call it uh, resource national, but in my view, it just wise you know, you know, you know, step and opportunity for Indonesia to size a lot of investment. And the way they could develop processing industry will actually create opportunity to develop infrastructure, to build any significant metal mining operation. You need ports, roads, mm -hmm. power plants, you need to develop you know, oh. grid, yeah. and of course the people. We'll see the few, pro we already saw a few projects here, and it's a great you know, opportunity to train people on this project. And another opportunity with China developing you know, recently, industrial development in China, create a chance for newcomers in processing in industry, build in you know, a pattern of capacity, cheapest and most efficient plant, mm. which ever we saw. You know, in, and it's, it's a great opportunity to- I have to ask to you, Oleg, bluntly, as a major player in commodities, does it matter to you if Indonesia, let's not call it resource nationalism or economic nationalism, does it matter to you that they're trying to keep more of the value added at home? Of course it's matter. You know, we can invest with them and uh, with local partners. We can develop this you know, plants more efficient because we know the market, we you know, control technology ourselves. And uh, you know, in my view, Indonesia is it's key, not just for in a lot of resources, in tin, nickel, aluminum, I know, but also you know, for China, but it also would be you know, key supplier you know, for India as well in seven, you know, nine years. Okay. And in my view, you know, this policy, and I, and I think more countries should encourage this policy, could also take in consideration in, you know, intergovernment relations. We see, you know, we, we saw recent visit of you know, Chinese leaders you know, and contract which was signed based on this guidance. It's $22 billion contracts. Mm. We, we can see you know, more improvement in proper pricing arrangement because at the moment it's not fair. Country favored you know, export and import you know, in the raw materials you know, mm. without you know, processing, and they're not favored in you know, the process in the product, which I think you know, should be dealt through the you know, arrangement in, in trading partnership and also, also sort of new you know, agreements. And in my view, of course, the you know, pricing should be adjusted because at the moment 
price mechanism based on in London, LM, and LME, you know, cover only all trade. You know, we can't see you know, how Asia would be in Asian you know, demand and supply would be implemented. Yeah. And I think a lot of improvement could be done. Oleg has a, uh, has a bit of a beef with the, uh, with the LME, which we'll get back to in just a bit. But let's swing all the way from commodities over to, to pharma, big pharma, and life sciences, and talk about uh, the TPP. You know, it's unfortunate, obviously, that President Obama could not uh, be with us. But, I mean, the fact of the matter is, I think everybody in this room would agree that much as the U.S. would have preferred otherwise, the reality is, look, we were never going to get a deal at APEC. It was never going to be announced here. But let me ask you this. There are worries that the TPP uh, and provisions to do with intellectual property that affect uh, big pharma would put a lot of the poorer or the poorest people in this part of the world, or at least among signatory countries, at a disadvantage. They wouldn't be able to get the medicine they needed through generics because under the TPP, patent protection would possibly extend beyond the, the normal 20 years. Uh, for you, Sanofi, right? You guys are French, not part of this at all. If TPP were to go through, would it put you at a disadvantage or an advantage? I'm curious. Well, I think we have to look at this from the, from the broader picture. What, what is actually the prize that we're going after? Yeah. Um, you know, to, to, to take on from uh, President Pinera's uh, four pillars, I give you the example of two countries, Jamaica and Singapore. In the 1960s, both had similar populations. Both had GDP per capita of around $2,200. Today, the GDP per capita of Jamaica is $5,400, and the per capita GDP for Singapore is $59,000. Now, Singapore is not a country where there's an awful lot of natural resources, and Singapore has made a huge investment in science and technology education um, has built an, an impressive biotechnology facility, has built impressive research facilities. So I think, it, you know, what we're really looking at, there is a, an element which is related to economic growth that are very much correspond to these four pillars. And, and therefore, I think enhancing intellectual property only serves to protect the ideas of those people that we've been investing in. Now, that does not mean, by any means, that we can forget about access to care. That is absolutely critical. And we have seen this in, in numerous circumstances around the world. And we have to find models of, of ensuring that, that care is, is delivered. But care is not just drugs. You know, uh, I was in India last week. Uh, we recited the example of, 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 a, of a woman who died of cancer. The drug was available for free in the hospital, but she couldn't get into the hospital. So there is an element where we also have to focus on building healthcare infrastructure. Mm. Now, the president raised an extremely important point, which was we also have to get the health of people better. Because right now, at least in developed countries, three quarters of our healthcare budget are going to the management of chronic disease, many of which are preventative. Mm. Are preventive. Um, and yet, if you look at our healthcare systems, we spend very little in terms of actual prevention. In mm. fact, we actually have sick care systems because all of the resources are going to when someone gets sick. But we don't keep enough, uh, we don't spend enough to keep people well. If you do that, mm -hmm. you can actually release some of the resources that are going to, to diseases like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and actually invest then in, in those things that we can't prevent. And the second thing is, I think this industry has been extremely advanced in, in thinking about different models. We already have tiered pricing across countries where we price according to income per capita. Mm -hmm. And we have within the, uh, the, the Gates Roundtable, which I have the privilege of, of co-chairing with Bill Gates, models in two countries where we're looking at differentiated pricing within a country, because within many emerging markets, we're seeing significant disparities of income. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, really, the access issue isn't for the whole population. It is for targeted populations. Okay, Chris, hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break on our debate here on uh, the future forward or the way forward for growth here at the Apex Summit. We're coming right back.
can I come to you uh, when we start again? Yeah. Can we talk about the WTO? WTO versus TPP, RCEP, and Indonesia's position. Welcome back to the APEC Summit and our discussion on growth the way forward. And let me pick up with uh, Bakatib here and uh, talk about trade agreements as a way to uh, drive uh, growth. Uh, here at the summit, of course, TPP is still under discussion, uh, still hotly debated, very controversial as well. China, of course, has its model, the RCEP, but Indonesia as host country is still, seems like it's hell-bent on making sure that Doha doesn't die. WTO meets here, in fact, uh, in, in, in December. But, you know, people take a look at Doha and what it has achieved, or rather not, and say, look, 20 years since then, we've had the internet, we've had a lot of other stuff, social media, and this thing is so outdated. Why stick with trying to keep Doha alive? Well, I think it is important to solve the problem through the multilateral because there are many sensitive issues you cannot discuss only through the regional. For example, let me give an example about agriculture. If you're talking about the sensitivity issue on the agriculture, the second one is also about the market access in, from the emerging market. So I think some issues related to Doha development agenda is still pretty relevant. Um, about about two, year, two years ago, two years ago, I was in the high-level panel of trade with Jack Dispakwati and Peter Sutherland, and sort of like we, we produced a report, the so-called The Last Chance for Doha. And one important thing on the message on that report is in order to invite many countries, emerging economies, to get involved on the three trade agreement, there should be an incentive from the supply side in terms of the aid for trade. Mm -hmm. And Doha development also discussed about this issue. Mm -hmm. But the most important one is I still believe that you know, the multilateral solutions will maybe um, you know, create a sort of like a plausible solution for some issues, the sensitive issues about agriculture. The other thing is every regional agreement always talk about WTO plus, mm. right? If you're talking about WTO plus, then you don't have to benchmark about the WTO itself. Then you cannot have this WTO plus. Mm. So it is very, very important for us to sort of like to ensure that this Doha agenda development still continue. Interesting. Uh, Mr. President, I didn't mean to leave you out. Talk to us about, of course, Chile was uh, uh, one of the proponents, original proponents of, of TPP, yet as a country, you're also pushing for the Pacific Alliance. How do you uh, make these two things work together? Well, one thing that occurs when the world is facing problems that a lot of protectionist force appear everywhere. We have to be able to control and defeat them and that's why this is a time to push forward free trade at every level. In the case of Chile, of course, we are... Let me interrupt you. Are you surprised though first that since the crisis erupted, the great financial crisis, we actually have not seen much evidence of protectionism globally? Yes, because we have been extremely concerned about that, and that's one of the main targets of the G20 meetings mm. and the APEC meetings, because otherwise mm. you would have seen exactly what happened in, in the world in the 1930, after the crisis, that protections appeared everywhere. So we have to be very careful because that's a real enemy, and we have to have it to keep it under control. But in the case of Chile, we are founders of the TPP, because the TPP is based in what it was called the P4, which was the first effort of economic integration of countries in both sides of the Pacific Ocean. Mm. Those were Singapore, uh, New Zealand, Brunei, and Chile. And we have added to that the US, Canada, Mexico, Peru, mm. uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and many other countries. 
So we are pushing that TPP. We won't be able to announce an agreement in this APEC meeting. Mm. But it doesn't mean that we are not committed to move forward. Of course, there are some problems. One of them is intellectual property rights. We need to protect intellectual property rights, of course. Otherwise, who will invest in that industry? Mm. The question is how much, mm -hmm. how long? Mm -hmm. And that's something which has been uh, discussed, and we haven't been able to reach an agreement on that yet, mm. but I'm sure that we will. With respect to the Pacific Alliance, that's an extremely successful experience. Very young. It's one year old. Sure. But we have already accomplished probably a very deep, not only economic integration, it's not only free trade of goods and services, it's also investment movement of people. And those four countries, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile, represent more than 50% of total trade of Latin America and more than 200 million people, together the four economies would be today the eighth or ninth largest economy in the world. And that, there we are moving very rapidly because we share the same values and the mm. same views. Mm. And by the way, since we are talking about free trade, I would like to invite the Minister of Finance of Indonesia because we have free trade agreements with almost every country in the world. One of the countries that we are really interested in starting negotiation is Indonesia. So I would like to, since we have all these witnesses, uh, to invite you <laughs> to do that. Uh, and no no the, pressure. The, yeah, no pressure. And I, I, I understand that that smile is a yes. But what do you say? Well, it is very important to look at the relationship between ASEAN and Latin America. Yeah, I think, I think it's probably about a year ago we organized a sort of like meeting to look at, to explore the possibility between ASEAN and Latin America. Mm -hmm. I think this is really one of the potential uh, that we need to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. President, back to the TPP that's, if we... That, yes. that's, that's a yes or a no? <laughs> oh, oh, you're not giving up. All right, go ahead. I'll just sit back and you, can, you two guys go at it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well... I think, Mr. President, um, Indonesia has its own roadmap about some Asia-Pacific economies, but we are exploring about this, you know, some possibilities with the Latin American countries as well. We are in the early stage to explore this possibility. Mm. I hope I address your question. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's why I like these panels. Anyway, okay, uh, Mr. President, back to TPP if we could. Uh, I was at a private dinner last night, and we were talking about precedents. We, uh, NAFTA came up, and the opposition publicly to that, we all remember that. And it's incumbent, it's incumbent I think, upon a lot of uh, the governments involved in TPP, or who end up being involved in TPP, they need, one of the big challenges is to sell this, the benefits of this agreement to the people, the populace, societies, voters, right, as governments. One of my problems with TPP for many, many months now has been why it has been so difficult to get a handle on some of the details on, on some of the issues here. It has not necessarily been uh, done in a very transparent manner, or could have been done much more transparently. There are, there's a lot of talk that even congressmen in the US, they don't even know what's going on with TPP. How is that possible? And what do you say to, uh, what do you say when people talk to you about this? Yeah, that's a good point. We have made a huge progress towards a TPP, but we still have some problems, particularly in the area of intellectual property, in the area of how to force or enforce labor and environment rules. But now we will enter a second stage, which has to be much more transparent, because we will need to share what we have uh, done with uh, with, the, with our people in our with, country. With respect, why second stage now after you've already been through 20 because rounds of talks? Because at the beginning you have to, talks. in order to be transparent, you need to be able to show something. You cannot be transparent and say, look, here I am and I don't know what I want to do. Okay. Now we have something to show and share with our Congress and economies and the society, and therefore we are entering a second stage, which won't be easy, okay. because you know that in every country, there are some sectors that want to protect their sector and open up all the other sectors. Yeah. That's human nature. Yeah, yeah, okay. And therefore, we have to deal with these uh, pressure groups, which yeah. exist everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is that we need to, to 
show them that this agreement will be to the best benefit of each and every country. And mm. we need, of course, to reach agreements in areas which have been very, very difficult. And for that, we will need to be, need be much more flexible. Mm. And the U.S. will have to be more flexible because in this case, uh, there are views which, which uh, in this case, we are dealing with so many countries that everybody will have to be more flexible in order to be able to reach a good free trade agreement in the, in the Pacific area because otherwise, we will have to rely on, on the world trade organization, the Doha rounds, which are not going anywhere. Mm. And I think that the Pacific, the Trans-Pacific Partnership could become the largest free mm. trade zone in the world. Mm. Yeah, uh, a free trade agreement for the, for the 21st century, for the 22nd uh, century. One other uh, issue that's been very controversial is what's known as ISDS, I'm sure you know, uh, 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 Investor State Dispute uh, Settlement. I was talking to a former uh, USTR official last night who was saying, that, look, What's the big deal? This has been around for, for many years, and historically, there's, there's no precedent to, to suggest that we should have any fear that this could be abused by corporate interests. And I want to ask Chris this. What it essentially means is, you know, if you're a signatory part of TPP, you don't like a specific country's regulatory environment. You feel shortchanged or abused or whatever. You want to take it to court? You can, and you as a company can sue, end up suing a signatory government. I mean, obviously you're a French company, but I mean, when you hear stuff like this, you think what? Well, I think, you know, the, the theme of this conference again is growth. Mm. And so all of this has to be, what are we trying to do TPP for, but to, to increase growth? I think one of the problems that we have, first of all, is that many economies are now starting to be in transition. So the BRIC countries, for instance, represent a quarter of the world economy. And, and yet, they have really come to this point largely on the back of, of lower manufacturing costs and in some case resources. Now the BRIC countries are no longer the most competitive in terms of labor costs and having to move to higher value added industries. So suddenly you're in a negotiation on a, on a, on a treaty and, and think about which sectors you want to protect and which ones you want to encourage. Well, they may not be the same sectors as you had in the past. And, and certainly you're going to move to more knowledge based economies regulatory systems are extremely important in this process. And, and therefore, having harmonization of regulatory is, is extremely important. I mean, if you look at, at for instance, the time it takes um, to develop a drug, it's, it's, it's already 10 years for everybody. But it could take, for instance, between the time the FDA approves a new drug and many other countries, another four or five years could go by only just because of regulatory issues. Now, you know, it's the same size dossier and, and it takes the same amount of time to read. Um, all of us are building manufacturing facilities around the world, and yet our company, which has about 80 um, facilities in, in pharmaceuticals, gets audited by probably 60 different countries. Mm. You know, if you could actually start, and, and they're all sending um, uh, inspectors overseas, it costs an awful lot of money, so you could actually increase uh, this knowledge flow, you could have uh, regulatory harmonization. I'm sure in other sectors this is the case. So nobody wants to sue a signatory government. Mm. I think those are kinds of the things, if you don't put something in there that if, if, if no other way works, you, 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 do the, you, you may have some sort of legal recourse. Mm. But I do think this focus on regulatory harmonization is extremely mm. important. But as a company, you would like to see that provision in? Yes. Okay, fair enough. Listen, we're, we're going to take a quick break. Our debate here at the Apex Summit continues after this.
don't say, yeah, for that you need to protect Welcome back to the APEC Summit and uh, we continue our discussion, our debate on the growth of the way forward in OLEC. Let's uh, come back to you. We were talking about the merits of uh, free trade systems or free trade agreements, excuse me, TPP. Um, we've talked about Doha. We haven't exactly talked about RCEP yet, but I'm sure we'll get to it. As a businessman in the get your hands dirty, the upstream and commodities, what does this all mean to you? I mean, how closely are you watching whether somebody, uh, you know, we, we're go, we go with TPP, whether Doha, uh, whether China pushes their RCEP? As my colleague mentioned, I think we all talk about growth and quality of the growth, which will finally result in better life standard. Of course, for us, very important uh, how country react, and it's not about just international agreement, but also national regime and performance of you know, national bureaucracy and climate, which we can see. For us, very important you know, how quickly we can bring our costs down and our risk down through the, you know, this agreement. And this is a key element for anyone who consider investment in, in emerging market. And as I mentioned, you know, development and proper infrastructure you know, in resource sector can't be done without government intervention, especially now when market very turbulent, you know, you know, fin you know financial system would be in this more, in, more in distress after quantitative easing, you know, would, would, you know, would end up. And uh, only you know, strong you know, government involvement and policy, you know, you know how to uh, you know, create you know, you know, incentives you know, for companies like us you know, to invest you know, you know, could guide you know, you know, us through, you know, through this turbulent time. I hate to be rude, but you would say that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, let me come to you here. Uh, we were chuckling during the, the break just now, and uh, obviously you're not part of the whole TPP initiative. You're trying to revive the Doha. Well, I think if you're talking about this, this uh, regional trade agreement, one thing that Indonesia is always look at is about the open regionalism. Yeah. Because as I said, as I mentioned to you earlier, some sensitive issue you cannot resolve through only the, the, you know, the regional uh, agreement, especially if this close regional system. Um, the other thing, if you look at the RCEP, in terms of the volume of trade, it's probably you are talking about 30% or even probably about 40% of the global trade over the world. Basically, you are talking about a very largest group of economists, mm. member of this RCEP. Mm. But I think the most important one is about the commitment for each country to move forward that. And I think this has been discussed in the last uh, leaders meeting in ASEAN summit last year in, in Phnom Penh about some uh, sort of like notable step that we are preparing for the RCEP. Mm. Would it be fair to say that the RCEP is probably more politically realistic, realistically achievable, well, politically, then say something as... Uh, Martin, there's always a trade-off between the, you know, the quality of the agreement with the number, number of this member of the, you know, of the group. For example, like when I mentioned about Doha, Doha is the lowest common denominator, you know, if you put on the, on the trade agreement. If you want to, to put RCEP in the similar context as well, it should be a lowest common denominator in order to each country to get involved in that. Because without that, if you're talking about one, any particular trade agreement, yeah, then you cannot have, have a benchmark and not many you know, countries or would like to participate on that one. Well, you, sh you should start from the uh, sort of like getting any countries to get together on that process, yeah? Because in my view, this is, this is my experience in the policy making process. When you start with the something very high standard and not, not many countries get involved on that, then the question is, you end up with this, not with the open regionalism, but the close regionalism, then this might create a sort of like trade diversion rather than trade creation. And Would this it, is something that we have to, 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 to concern about. Okay, is this a nice way of saying that under RCEP, uh, the dominant power of China would 
not impose as many constraints as would exist on the, the TPP? Well, I'm not saying that um, there is no standard, mm. and I'm talking about the RCEP. But if you start with this open regionalism, which more country get involved, I think because like it or not, if you're talking about the Pacific, Asia Pacific economies, somehow we need to look at the accession of China. Mm. China is a very important for the Southeast Asian economy, like it or not. Most of the Southeast Asian country, they export their product to China. China is the largest Indonesia's trading partner. So if you come up with this or sort of like open regionalism, that will be beneficial for many Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia, for example. Oleg, let me bring you in on this, and I ask you this question not as a, uh, uh, as a businessman, but as someone who also happens to be, and I think this is well known, very close to the President Putin. China's influence uh, out here economically is uh, in just the last couple of days alone, uh, with the president's visit, I think Indonesia has done $22 billion yeah. worth of deal, uh, 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 deals, including many in the resource space, correct? This is viewed by Russia how? Very positive. In China, after Europe, most important partner for Russia. And if you look at Russian map, you know, Russia is not a country, Russia is a continent. And two sort of our territory nation. And of course, you know, we'd, we would love to see that China grows, you know, a higher rate and uh, you know, we will definitely share, you know, opportunity with Indonesia, with Malaysia, with Chile, you know, you know through this, you know, growth in China. Mm. It's very important. The most stable China, the most stable Asian Pacific region is. Okay, can we all, are we all, and, and the more stable Asia Pacific, the more stable the world. Okay, all right. All right, gentlemen, uh, we have just uh, a little bit of time left for, for this particular debate. I want to just go swing right through 30 seconds, closing thoughts on growth, where it's going to come from, and how, starting with Chris. Well, I think, uh, first of all, I would not count out emerging markets. Um, there is an awful lot of focus on macroeconomic indicators, but within countries, there's still significant opportunities. Brazil, for example, is still creating a middle class at double digits, even though the economic growth has gone from 6% from to 1%. And the second thing I would say is that you're seeing a resurgence of growth in the developed world, largely because of this innovation and entrepreneurship. And, and I actually think that a, a country to be competitive today has to have very competitive universities and is, is uh, committed to building human capital really through education in science, technology, engineering, and, and mathematics, and then investing in those industries that actually utilize um, those people coming out of those, those academic institutions. Okay, which, is, which essentially means you need to invest in your people. Yes. And starting young. Absolutely. Mr. President? Well, there are so many things that we have to do in order to regain our capacity to grow at 5% and not only 3% of which is the case. Yeah. One thing is that many countries will have to face their own problems at once. All the imbalances in terms of fiscal deficit, current account deficit. That's something that we'll have to de deal with by the Europe, the US, in one direction and probably China and other countries in the other direction. Mm -hmm. But for developing countries, I'm absolutely convinced that if you want to be part of this new society of knowledge and information, we need to build or strengthen mm. those four pillars, which I mentioned before. Education is mm. key mm. because we are lagging behind. And without a good quality education, there is nothing that we can do in this society of knowledge and information. But also, of course, there are so many other things, but we need to uh, emphasize the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship. Because mm. in many of these countries, the government is not pushing innovation and entrepreneurship, but it's doing just the opposite. And the third thing is science and technology, because otherwise we will lag behind. And there is a big problem of inequalities in many, many developing economies, which has to be addressed, because otherwise yeah. nothing will be stable. Okay, all right. Back. Well, if you look at on the composition of the global growth, the APEC economies is contributed about 6.1% of the, you know, to the, to the global growth, whereas some countries in Europe is still struggling with, you know, 
one, uh, zero to one percent growth. Definitely, uh, the role of this emerging market, the role of the APEC economies become very crucial. So I still believe that beyond this, uh, moving the trajectory path back into the equilibrium after the world, after QE, the potential market will be in the emerging market. Then you can talk about this growing middle class. A country like Indonesia, there will be a, maybe about 135 million people as considered as a middle class. We are talking about the new consuming class, about the business opportunity, and don't forget, 70% of people in uh, Asia Pacific economies, we live in urban, is mm -hmm. going to create another, you know, a lot of business related to infrastructure, to services, to energy resources and everything, and mm. also the consuming class. And this is similar, it also applies to country like Indonesia. And one thing I would like to remind you, Martin, and this is very important, investing in Indonesia is very dangerous because it's addictive. It's addictive. <laughs> oh, I like that. Wow, that's, that's, that's pretty shrewd marketing there. Oleg, last thoughts. It's clear that the you know, growth will come you know, you know, from United States and Asia you know, could also you know, add a lot. And you know, key factors, of course, it's energy solution and uh, energy which will reflect in you know, a new approach towards environment because growth middle class you know, will definitely demand proper you know, living standard. And the way you know, you know, energy solution should be developed you know, in the future definitely you know, reflect you know, you know, need to protect environment because environment not just air pollution but also it's the water and water will highly affect the you know, food and especially for Asia it would be one of the key you know, factor in the future. Okay, excellent. I'd like to very quickly thank our uh, panel Oleg Bakhatib, uh, Mr. President Pinera and also uh, Chris and thank you folks for watching and joining us here on this debate at the APEC Summit. Okay, so look, don't go away. Uh, that was the TV part of it, but you folks are obviously still here. And I promised you at the beginning that we'd, uh, we'd bring you in towards the end. So we've got about, uh, I'd say about maybe 10 minutes for, for questions and answers or, or, or uh, Q&A and, and comments. So feel free. Uh, I'm pretty sure there should be microphones running around. So just raise your hand. Ah, there we go. Uh, sir. Just let us know who you are, uh, where you're from, who you represent, and who your comment is directed towards. If we could have a microphone for the gentleman there, please. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you, Martin. Uh, my name is Albert Ting. I'm from Taiwan. I have a question for uh, Minister uh, Basri. I remember hearing Your Excellency in Taipei a few years ago, and I remember I was very impressed. You made a particular point on creating intangible assets through increase of government efficiency. Um, could you share uh, with us some of the best practices uh, that potentially Indonesia can share with the rest of ASEAN? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your question. As I said, as I mentioned in, in my, in my uh, statement before, one of the important intangible assets in the future will be no longer physical assets but is the government policy, which create a very conducive investment climate, streamlining the regulations. You know, Martin, jokingly, I keep saying this to my colleague in the, in the cabinet, one of the reasons why many people in Indonesia has become religious is because they have to deal with the government. You know? <laughs> because every time you submitted the document, you have to wait. You... And this, this kind of practices, we cannot continue with this. We have to start with this simplification of the regulations, make it transparent. And we started in some of us in Indonesia with the pilot project, and we would like to extend it to continue. By doing this structural reform, then I do believe that the intangible asset in terms of providing the good or the conducive investment climate that will be, you know, could be implemented. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, right in the center, sir. If we could uh, give this gentleman a microphone. Run it over. Excellent, terrific. Yes, good, good. Yes, sir. Uh, 我是中国远东控股阶段的创始人，这个董事局主席蒋新培。
我们大家知道，现在的这个国际经济社会发展当中，遇到了很多的困难和问题。这个有的讲呢，这些问题和困难呢，都是这个长期资源错配的结果；有的讲是，呃，都是企业家的问题；也有的讲是是政治家们这个操纵的问题。这我就想啊，这个，呃，请问总统和总理。你们如何看待这样的评价？你们如何定位与中国的经济关系？谢谢。Okay, uh, your our little translation machine thingies were they working for you folks? No, they weren't working for me either. So listen, I, I have to admit, I have to be honest about this. I'm pretty embarrassed. Uh, uh, okay, I, I'm okay, ethnically okay. Chinese uh, myself, but I had absolutely no idea what was saying. What was saying? So, uh, well, that's the best question. Because you can answer whatever you want. Well, there you go. Okay. Okay. Now, now, translate. Uh, translate. Okay. 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 Okay
if you look at the composition of the export in many countries, if you're talking about Thailand, about Vietnam, about you know, many countries in Southeast Asia, China is a very dominant. That is why many countries in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, always watching about the, you know, the economic development in China, including the slowing economic growth in the past, uh, you know, past two years. If you grow by about seven to seven and a half percent, that will be an impact on Indonesia because maybe around um, 40, 40 percent of our export is energy and commodity related, which is somehow affected by the demand from China. Mm. So the role of China is definitely very important for the many emerging economies in Asia. How, how much of your exports now go to China? Yeah. Uh, sorry? How much of your exports now go to China? Um, it's about uh, 12%, if I'm not mistaken. 12%. 12%. Okay. Interesting. All right. Uh, let's try and be fair. We've done the center. We've done the right. Let's do the left here. Uh, the gentleman in the front row, sir. Uh, nope, that's you. Yeah. Oh, you're deferring to your colleague there? Okay. No. Here we go. Yes, sir. Thanks, Martin. My name is uh, Roger Hamilton from Entrepreneurs Institute, and I have a question for President Panera. Uh, in my field, which is entrepreneur education, Startup Chile is known around the world as one of the best examples of a government attracting entrepreneurship into their country, uh, especially because you are encouraging people from overseas to come in as well. What, uh, what would you say are the most important principles for uh, either companies or governments, and our, our organization is based here in Indonesia, uh, what would you say is the most important principles to create a program to encourage entrepreneurship? Well, first of all, education and entrepreneurship are very complementary. We are almost increasing by 60% in a four-year period our investment in education in Chile. And we are undertaking a huge reform at every level of the educational sector, not only university, but also school level and preschool level in order to guarantee to every Chilean that they will have access to good quality education at every level. That's something that we think is absolutely necessary in order to be able to achieve our goal of becoming a developed country before the end of the, this decade. Chile is a country with a per capita income of 20,000, which is the highest per capita income in Latin America. Yes. By the way, Chile was in, in the position number 10 only 10 years ago, something like that, and it was the poorest Spanish colony. So that's something which is based in those intangible that the Minister of Finance was talking before. And with respect to entrepreneurship, we have this program which is called Startup Program, by which we're trying to import entrepreneurs, innovators, from all over the world. What we do is that we have a, a kind of competition and the best projects are selected and we give the, the, those people not only a scholarship, which is a $40,000 scholarship so they can initiate their investment or the project in Chile, but also we give them many other facilities and it has proved to be extremely successful because we are attracting uh, the best ideas and, 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 and the best innovators from all over the world. And once they come to Chile, they start to irradiate that knowledge, that attitude uh, to many, many other Chileans. And therefore, uh, we have done a, a huge reform in order to promote entrepreneurship. One of the, of the aspects of this reform that in Chile today, you can create a company in one day with no cost. So it's a very simple way. That's why we are moving up in the doing business uh, ranking, which is done by an international organization very rapidly because normally governments do not promote entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. On the opposite, they put problems and problems and problems. And that's something which we have changed to, to change our culture because if we do not promote innovation and entrepreneurship, everything else won't work either. So there are many, many things that we have to address to be addressed simultaneously. Mm. If we want to make this big change from underdevelopment to development country, because uh, you were telling us the experience of Jamaica and Singapore, of course. Uh, and Jamaica has more natural resources than Singapore because Singapore yeah, has none. Yeah. And therefore, if you had to make a bet 50 years ago, Jamaica would have been picked. And the situation is just the opposite because I think that Singapore is a very good experience to study and to learn from. Okay, Mr. President, with that, we'll have to leave it. I've been told to, uh, to wrap this up. Thank you so much also to Chris, Pakatib, and Oleg, and thank you all for being part of this.
ladies and gentlemen, kindly now rise for the departure of the president. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. You were excellent. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> With the oh, well, I see Pretty to meet you. I'll convey your message to my president. Hmm. Thank you. President. Nice to see you again, huh? Mr. President. That was great. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you will drive this policy. Sure. Well done, no? Well done. Excellent. Yes, thank you so much. We have a bilateral so much. Tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. You have that. Well, thank you. So, uh, you know, let's but, hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, our president shall be leaving soon, when he can. Uh, let me talk you through a little bit about what to expect in terms of our program. I'm going to jump straight to tomorrow because we're trying to keep a big picture of, of what to expect. And uh, now tomorrow's highlights, we have another very power-packed day. I will be kicking off in the morning with some very exciting business personalities from DHL, from Walmart Asia, from Honhai, Foxconn, and also AirAsia in our first session of day two in our dialogue on Asia-Pacific connectivity. After that, we'll be having a brainstorming session on what to expect in the very near future. More big names are Jeffrey Sachs from the Earth Institute, Mark Tucker from the AIA Group. We have Klaus Schmidt-Hebel, an economist, and also the author of The Great Convergence, Kishore Mahbubani. They'll all be with us tomorrow for the first two sessions. So, we shall break for lunch. We look forward to your return here at just before 2 o'clock to start at 2 promptly. We'll be having the presidents of the Philippines and Peru to talk about inclusive growth. <clears throat> so, enjoy your lunch and we'll have you back here at 10 to 2, ready to start at 2 p.m. Our session with the Philippines president and the president of Peru on inclusive growth. Enjoy your meal.